Parker, joined as always by my co-host Ryan Sinitsky. Hello, sir. Hello there. Hi, we're finally back. My fault. Polar Run got in the way. And he didn't tell us about it. Eh. I, lo- I have a calendar, and I maintain it, but yeah, I rarely look a he, week ahead. He tells us, like, after we're done recording the episode, I think it was, like, back at his house, like, watching a movie, and then... No, it's, like... <laughs> it's one of those times where it's, like, you're walking through the desert, and you see a mirage. It's, like, me walking through the house, and then my brain's just, like, oh, oh, that's I'm the thing. gone this weekend. <laughs> Podcasts are on the weekend. should probably tell Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> and then that the rest as they say is history so yeah the confusing uh wednesday episode on saturday i just split it out to try to make it a little more consistent for the weekend listeners and so somebody had things to listen to on monday morning there we go but yeah back two episodes this week and uh business as usual hopefully for a while yes hopefully um anyway beer we have none you have a shamrock shake and i have a vanilla latte yep uh, it is just barely on the edge of too early for me to be drinking beer so yeah I, uh, I got here actually at 9 a.m. I was doing some differential fluid changes on uh, Scott's Element. Oh, fun. Long overdue. So that was here, and then I just cleaned up the garage a bunch. And yeah, now I'm downing a murder-sized shamrock shake. The life ooze of February. Yes, it's true. used to be March, but now it's February. So it's okay, whatever. It's uh, Easter creep. <laughs> To be fair, or uh, St. Patty's Day creep, I guess. I don't know. Damn long ass trying to take Easter away from Jesus. So Easter is like my least favorite holiday because to me as a Jewish person, it's a random day sometime in spring where everything's closed. Yeah. Like I, I don't know when it's, I don't know what month it's here, April or March. It's one of those things that old people will yeah. respond to like, oh, it's Easter weekend. I'm like, dude, nobody knows when Easter weekend is. Like, I don't know when Memorial Day is. Like, don't use that. Like, tell me September 10th. Well, then we have this like weird holiday creep thing. So now I've got like anxiety from like <laughs> day after Valentine's Day until whenever it happens that I just I'm gonna have some stuff planned that I'm not gonna be able to do. Someone it, growing up in the church, you can go to church every Sunday and yeah. still not know when Easter is. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. I uh, I, I was in the church for 18 years. I actually I uh, a couple of years ago I hosted a Japanese nostalgia car meet. Uh, I was doing weekends, and I hosted one on Easter. And I totally forgot it was Easter. And, and so it was a really interesting, like, so cross-section of people. <laughs> well, it, it was all the Jewish people that were, like, in <laughs> Japanese nostalgic cars, like, local Facebook group. Sure. And then, like, all the Hmong people that, like, still, that practice Hmong shamanism. Yeah. And then, like, a couple of atheists. And, like, that's exactly who it was. No Christians that just didn't know Zero. or didn't care? Well, they're all doing family stuff. They're all stuck in, like, family things. So, like, I, I had no idea. And somebody told, okay. somebody told me, oh, it was weird that you hosted a car me at Easter. I'm like, today's Easter? <laughs> and then he was like, oh, that's why Jana offered to bring candy after oh. she was done with family it's, stuff. Oh. <laughs> and then I'm like, it explains the lack of traffic, too. <laughs> okay. This all makes a lot of sense now. <laughs> Excellent. I would still call that a happy accident. No, it was it was probably one of the best shows I've ever hosted. It was great. I loved it. <laughs> Met some really cool dudes. Uh, there's a guy that had a uh, 3.5 liter V6 swapped uh, front wheel drive Celica. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he took some trash and turned it into treasure. He had sold he had sold his previous project to fund that car. His previous project was an AE102 Corolla wagon okay. with a 20 valve 4AG in it. Is that a black top or a silver top? Uh, silver top. Okay. Five valve for cylinder. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Anyway, I think we should move on to news. Um, Sounds good. So I want to talk about uh, a garage staple. Um, if you get into cars early, and especially if you got into them maybe 20 or more years ago, before the advent of the internet and forums, yeah, how you started learning was getting a repair manual. And there are a couple of really, really big companies that do those, did do those, and still do them, that are not factory sponsored. So you've got specific ones like Bentley. They make a lot of stuff for, and not the car manufacturer Bentley. It's actually a publication company, Bentley Publishing. They do a lot of stuff for German and Italian cars, and they're known as, you know, a really, really thorough (coughs) teardown, and they'll go over specifics, you know, like valve lash and things like that, how things work. Mm-hmm. Even as far as like differential pinion preload, and then yeah, you've got it, things like Chilton's, which is sold over the counter at your Car Quest or your O'Reilly, which goes over like a glorified owner's manual. It gives you all the information you would get in an owner's manual, plus all the service points, and then a little bit more in depth with like specifications for torque and uh, jobs like head gaskets. And then there's a third one, the Haynes manuals. 
I actually, before we get to hands, I have a fun fact about Chilton's. Okay. Um, Frank Herbert, the guy who wrote the book Dune, mm -hmm. its original publisher was Chilton's. That's hilarious. He was like <laughs> super good friends with the with the owner of Chilton's, and they used to write in the same pulp fiction or the same pulp uh, science fiction magazine back in the forties together. I feel like I've heard of. I think Haynes published some really controversial book now that I think of it, too. <laughs> they probably did, like, uh, um, Starship Troopers or something. <laughs> probably. I, I seriously think that, like, I saw... Maybe it was Bentley Publishing. Not not, not to be outdone. <clears throat> I, but it was, like, some, like, uh, car guy memoir or something that, like, no publisher would take. Oh, really? And I think one of these big ones published. Anyway, so Haynes is the other one that you get largely over-the-counter at these auto parts stores. It'll cover, you know, like I said, oil changes. It'll cover, like, head gaskets, valve cover gaskets, things like that. But it won't necessarily cover, like, how to rebuild your transmission. So that is, or at least was, kind of the big crutch. Yeah. If you're in a pinch, you have no idea what you're doing. There's no forums. Or if you're in a rural area where there's no internet, you get the Haynes, you get the Haynes manual. Well, so, actually, the, the cool thing about Haynes is you have wiring diagrams. Uh, some do, a lot don't. Oh, really? Um, yeah. And the diagrams that they do include are usually for fairly basic systems. Okay. Um, things like the Bentley manuals include full ETMs. Which That'd be really, really cool. Really, really, really cool. Um, yeah, because I remember my Haynes manual saved my life a couple of times with my Supra and okay. with my Civic. Maybe so. with a little more uh, simplistic systems they were able Probably, to throw yeah. them in there. So I'm sure it varies from make to make. But anyway, the, the founder of Haynes just died oh, at no. 80. Oh, no. So 80, that's relatively young. That's yeah. I mean, that's 80 is the new 50, right? So well, that's more like the new 70, but yeah, whatever. 60, we'll go 60. Enough. Yeah, 60. Then yeah. just look how happy that guy is. Oh, I'm gonna take apart these cars and write these manuals. You know, he looks like the kind of guy who would write a car repair manual when it wouldn't touch like complex systems like rebuilding transmissions. Actually, yeah. to be fair, I get why he wouldn't do that because if you're at a point. With working on your car where you need a Haynes manual, you yep. probably should not be touching your transmission. Probably not. He looks like he would own a Chevy Volt if he was still around now. So. Yeah, th There's another thing that's weird about Haynes manuals. So they split models really, really weirdly. Yeah. So, like, they put the EA Civic with the EF Civic. Like my, so with my wiring diagram issue. Um, when the EA Civic was this own like kind of weird mid 80s thing. What is an EA Civic? The 83 through 87. So it predated the EF? Yeah, it's the one okay. right before the EF. Um <laughs> but they they combined that with the EF even though it was like totally different suspension, totally yeah. different engine, totally different like everything. They, right. Nothing was they looked they physically looked alike. <laughs> but mechanically it's a completely <clears throat> different car. Um so a lot of redundant input, <laughs> but, but, potentially. But but then they had, like, the EG Civic and, like, I think it was, like, the EG Civic and, like, the Prelude or something. like, And then, like, the EK with, like, the Integra. It's just, like, why didn't you put the 88 through 2000 Civic together and mechanically identical? That's put really Put all weird. the Integras together and then put, like, the last two generations of Prelude together. It'd make that, That's how it would make sense. And then you take, like, the EA Civic and you combine that with the first gen Integra, maybe. <laughs> I guess but the only ones I've looked through have been BMW manuals, and it's kind of the opposite problem, where they don't cover, like, the E31. It's like there's an early and a late Haynes E30 manual, and their cars are almost identical, like, other than, like, exterior looks. So that's yeah. kind of a bummer. But Well, like, I remember with my Civic one, I was just, like, reading through it just to get, like, some vacuum diagram vacuum diagrams, and they're like, here's a mechanical advanced distributor on the Honda Civic up to February of 1987 and here's the electronic advance as of like n like december of 1988 and it's just like uh, what <laughs> <laughs> like what's where, where's this the 88 the early 88s with the mechanical advance distribution it's just really weird <laughs> that's best not to ask questions that's yeah probably what they would say but yeah no that's, that's, that's sad bummer, i mean i i didn't really use the manuals all that much because i had to mainly go with bentley's just because i needed those electrical diagrams and things like that but still sad nonetheless for yeah, something that he, he so many of us got you know started on yeah so. he helped a lot of people um well i got some good news okay um after i take a sip of my coffee <laughs> that sounds good i will uh, also take a sip of my shamrock shake and while you're mm. taking a sip of your sh shamrock shake i should remind everybody to uh Subscribe to our Patreon and donate to us to help us create more fantastic co uh, content and fun burgers, shamrock shakes. Nah, it's just funny Ryan's beer. Yep. 
Uh, anyway, so uh, what I wanted to talk about, though, was a story from Reuters, actually, so we know it's actually true. Um, <laughs> <coughs> the French government invested uh, $790 million into EV battery tech That's to help cool. the country advance uh, their EV tech. Mechanical advance or vacuum advance? Uh, uh, vacuum. <laughs> Let's cool. go with that. Um, so the reason they did that is currently all of the EV batteries are being made either in China or South Korea, if I'm not mistaken. Or the United States, no. That's true. With the Gigafactory. With the Gigafactory, but that's not really being used by... Ooh, look at this nouvelle battery. Yeah, exactly. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But It It smokes like a Citroën. What what they're trying to do is they're trying to get European cars weaned off of foreign uh, dependents. That's smart. And especially with the EU, it makes a lot of sense because places like Bulgaria... You know, you can set up manufacturing plants and then give, like, the five people under the age of 100 that left in <laughs> Bulgaria a job other than taking care of said old people in Bulgaria. And they can gentrify Bulgaria. It'll be great. I think we should – Bulgaria is a, go- a beautiful country. I'd love to gentrify Bulgaria. It's just they have zero infrastructure right now because everybody's 100 years old. Like, every single person in Bulgaria is a, a veteran of World War One. Is that country just going to disappear when those people die? <laughs> like they've, they are the fastest depopulating country in the world. Yeah, I know we've talked it, about that. On top you, of that, they've been a brain drain. I can, I just learned this in environmental biology. So if you give me the numbers, I can figure it out because I'm now an expert on the subject. There we about go. About when it will disappear? Yes. Cool. When will Bulgaria disappear? <laughs> These <laughs> are the things we really need to learn about. So this, this is what I'll bring up in my uh, presentation. This can be your thesis topic. Yeah. But a fun <laughs> fact: it is very cheap to live in Bulgaria. No way. So, yeah. So I mean, we could all just move to Bulgaria and get houses for very cheap. But I got a house for cheap here. Yeah, but this is in Bulgaria, and they need our help and money. Anyway, so <laughs> uh, what I found interesting about this I is. See. Um, <laughs> So France is really kind of giving their automotive sector the kick in the butt that it needs. Because France, it, it's always been that Germany invented the car and France perfected it. Um, meanwhile, America is doing absolutely nothing with EV tech. And in fact, we're stifling it because we're getting rid of the EV tax credits and stuff to get people to not buy them. I disagree. What is, what's the American government We sell doing? by far the most EVs, and we have the what's most our... innovative EV company in the world. Yeah, but what's our government doing to help? You said EV companies, uh, not right. government. Oh, well, th- e- with the c- given the context of the French government investing. We've still got some momentum from the Obama presidency. Okay, good. So, so once, yeah, that. once Trump is able to completely fuck our country. There's my F-bump. Yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah, that, that'll be bad. But by that point, we won't need incentives. That's good. Yeah, because... What I'm actually not really afraid of, uh, but the, the, my mental picture in my head was GM needs another bailout because they invest enough money in EVs. <laughs> meanwhile, we and are all... four-cylinder silver autos are getting worse MPGs than their v <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> and meanwhile, we're all happily puttering along in our Citroëns, which does not seem like a bad idea at all. I'm 100% on board with that. Well, I, gas just needs to get expensive again. A lot of this stuff will figure It'll itself explode, out. It'll explode, yeah. So... And, uh, that will probably happen at I, some point. I'm sure it will. We're due for a recession, so. Yeah, we are. Yay, recession. Whatever. That'll be fine. Anyway. I love how that, that photo in this article is from a 2016 auto show. It's a stock <laughs> photo. It's Reuters. <laughs> like, like, but it is from a, 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 a French a Renault. Yeah. yeah uh, well, it's actually, yeah, it's from Renault. But, um, no, uh, Peugeot, Citroën, Alliance, actually, they are getting the most money. I think Peugeot, front. Renault, and Volvo should get back together and redeem themselves from the DeLorean engine. I concur. <laughs> but then that's going to be the whole Chinese <laughs> company thing that uh, France is all salty about already. So <laughs> there's that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. I, I, w- it wasn't even that long ago that we saw somebody had actually spotted some Renaults like, puttering around in Detroit again, okay. right? It was Corey. It was no, in that Colorado. Was, that was a Mexico car oh but, uh, was, yeah. i'm talking about like actual like test oh yeah you're right yeah that i think are Ooh, pardon shamrock shakes are very gassy apparently but no i i think we were supposed to get the cactus or something like that i would C4. love to have the cactus that'd it's be perfect. great, that's a great I, I want a cactus that'd be great uh, anyway let's uh let's talk about new york police okay so you when you drive, do you use any uh, GPS system or anything Wh- like whatever that? Whatever I have Janet do while I'm frantically not trying to get <laughs> T-boned by a semi-truck. 
see, we're mm. actually just a rally team. And <laughs> we really are. I'm the, I'm the, you know, the co the, navigator? the navigator. Okay. So do you use software then? I use Waze. Okay, perfect. So this story is actually about Waze. I'm really glad you actually brought that up because it works perfectly as a segue into my yeah, story. I, lo I love Waze because it's the only um, like map that gets me to my place of work without trying to get me through that street that doesn't exist anymore. Oh, nice. Does because Google Maps not do that? Uh, no, it takes... All, like, cause, That's weird. They uh, run on the same engine. Yeah, because of the snow, um, like a lot of my coworkers have been afraid to drive, so they've been taking Uber. And their Ubers keep on getting lost <laughs> because of this mysterious road. Whereas, like, Waze, you can edit the location. And I think I've done that a few times. It always gets me there better. It's not perfect, but it's always I do better. like how in Waze you can actually go in and, like, close a road mm -hmm. that isn't there. If, yep. you, if you are one of the, yeah. like, the King Waze or whatever. But this story is about New York police getting pissed at Google, which owns Waze, because the user-controlled data that's being accrued yeah. by this is actually giving people heads up when there are DUI checkpoints up ahead. And so they're able to get off the road and that's get hilarious. around these checkpoints. And the police are just ass mad about this. And it's just absolutely hilarious that they're trying to censor this global social driving network app. That's really cool. Which we all love so much. Yeah, <laughs> I love the police function and it's not because like I'm disobeying the law necessarily. Right. Oh, I take stuff all the time. Like, it's no. because like, you know, sometimes when there's police it means there has been an accident or right. something and it just means like, hey, slow down. There's gonna be idiots that see a cop and slam on their brakes in the yeah. middle of the highway. It tells you what to expect. As yeah. opposed to just like a I'm just trying to save people a lot of money on their car insurance. Yeah, and like cops. when I do I'm, use so I'm just trying to <laughs> save people from having to sit in traffic. Yeah. <laughs> so like I don't know what it is, but like I live off of Normandale, which is Highway 100, and whenever I go from Normandale to Highway 100, for whatever freaking reason, it's like right by the nearest gas station, mm -hmm. so people run out of gas on the highway <laughs> all the time. But they don't go over to the proper shoulder. Sure. They always stop in the left lane or <laughs> in the middle of the road. Very and safe. One time, Ryan was with me when this happened, but somebody that was getting pulled over stopped in the middle lane on and 100. parked. On 100. This wasn't on even 100. On 100. wasn't even on Norbindale yet. It was on, like... Highway 100. Yeah, an actual, like... Highway, and if you're not from Minnesota, Highway 100 is not like a rural country bumpkin highway. No, Highway 100 is like the 404 in LA. Like it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. a, it's a highway highway. Like. It's, it's, it's a she's a big one. Yeah, it's like it's a main thoroughfare. Like for that most is of impressive. The I've actually yeah. seen a couple people over this winter with cars that are not disabled that have stopped in traffic lanes put their hazards on and have started like snow brushing their windows outside of their car. Oh, I've, no. I've seen it on two occasions. But yeah, so like, that, that's just uh, survival of the fittest at that point. Like, I do, <laughs> and I, I don't want to like draw, yeah. you know, boundaries of who these people are, but I believe they're maybe from the area near Augsburg. Uh, you mean they drive crossovers? Yes, they drive crossovers. Yes. The they're crossover close. drivers. Yep. Yep. They drive uh, crossovers. But yeah, so like, Sometimes I'll just use Waze because, like, 100 will go really well from where I'm driving. Yeah. But when I hit Edina, it just goes to a sudden halt, and it, like, doubles my traffic time. Sure. Oh my and God. so the other day, yeah. I was <laughs> dumb and did not have Waze on, and there was a Jana, car Jana, Jana. Just, that just, was stopped on 100 right after the stoplight. So, like, you didn't have enough time to, like, get out of this way. Hey, Jana. And they're getting towed one second uh for our listeners that again aren't familiar with the yeah. area 100 although it's a four-lane highway after once it gets to bloomington because it has about two miles left for, before it gets to Resident basically a, a giant like cliff um it turns into a two lane each direction oh yeah like yeah. south main of 494 yeah, yeah like boulevard yeah. so anyway i just want to i want to i want to specify yeah. that for you so yeah. like clarify yeah. Um, so yes, yeah. So when I was leaving the stoplight, there's this giant tow truck, a sh like not even a policeman. It was like sheriff, and you know. At least it wasn't a rent a cop. 
Yeah, but even with the <laughs> even with the emergency <laughs> <Paul> vehicle <laughs> <laughs> with way. its lights on and the tow truck <laughs> with its lights on, people still d couldn't see that this car was in the left lane stopped right after a stoplight. And it's like you could have turned <sighs> off to the gas station conveniently located downhill from I where you are. I hate people so much. Yeah, so I almost rear-ended a cop the other day. That was fun. <laughs> but yeah, things like yeah, having ways will really help you avoid situations like that because it, it's it, you need to know kind of what you're coming up to because again, it's like I said before, you know, coming to exclamation point, it can be construction, yeah. it can be a you know, somebody that's pulled over in the center lane. Mm -hmm. It can be, you know, a car on the side of the road. But if you actually have a little police hat, you go, okay, I should probably slow down. Because, A, I know for a fact there would be people that are either in the middle of a lane or extremely near a lane. Right. Or I have to worry that maybe they might be pulling out in front of me. If it's a construction thing, you know, okay, cool, there's going to be a lane shut down. Mm -hmm. I should probably pay attention to what lane shut down. And there's going to be a lot more light that's visible. A police car, you're not going to see all much. You see the flashing lights on one yeah. side of the road, or in Jan's case, the center of the road. And again, that's a really hilly area, too. So yes. if you're, You need that, yeah. If, I mean, you could come over that hill at the speed limit, and it would be potentially difficult. I guess oh, yeah. New York police are just probably salty, because it's like, you never get over 10 miles an hour in the city of New York. <laughs> so, like, they don't understand that other, other places in the world have issues. Our stream computer just told me it's low on disk space. Weird. Uh, okay, sorry guys. I do have to look into this because I don't want the recording to fail. Um, but okay. yeah, so like that's what I use Waze for because I live in a very hilly area and I you can't see what's ahead of you. Like the other day when it wasn't too terribly snowy, but it was snowy, there were six cars that spun out in a span of a quarter mile in Normandale. Um, yeah, that was pretty so bad. I remember that, that. Was, that was terrible. Waze would have told me about that. I actually reported that on Waze because I was like, what the fuck is did, going on? <laughs> did you forget to plug in something? No. Um, the hard drive wasn't showing up. However, it says we have 4.5 megabytes of free disk space right now. So it hasn't failed recording, but I'm guessing it will. Oh. So what I'm doing is I'm going to take all the old episodes off and throw them on the external. Clever. Uh, this thing must have a tiny main drive. Yeah, it's 111 gig. <coughs> okay, 128 SSD. Fine, whatever, it's fine. But anyway, yeah, I... Why don't you just go buy a 1T ter uh, hard drive for like 10 bucks now? Uh, because it's not $10. Uh, yeah, sorry, 25 or whatever so there now. So much on equipment, I'm just That's not fair. doing anymore right now. That's totally fair. Um, but yeah, Paul Blart needs to get his head out of his ass and yeah. stop messing with Waze. Yes. Because they, they like, they demanded to Google that they like disable features on that's Waze. So stupid. Really? It's like no, that's not. That's happening. not happening. That's not how it like, works. I get you're trying to catch drunk drivers. That's an admirable goal. They're not gonna stop tagging stuff. Just do your job better. Do you remember? Do you remember the big burly cop that took a stripper and um, yes. did the right thing? Yeah, that, <laughs> How that's could a I forget. That's that's the guy that's complaining. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> but yeah, and like, are drunk people even using ways? No, are that's the thing. Like, enough? if you are with it enough to open ways, look at the entire route ahead, which you will have to do to see yeah. this. And not crash on the way. Like, yeah, you're clearly like not you are drunk. not that drunk. Yeah, like there's. The, the Waze is not the issue here. Because, I mean, Waze, when you're driving down the road, it will notify you of police ahead, yeah. but, like, it's, like, a half a mile. The odds of you being able to exit and avoid that in a half a mile, if you're loaded while driving, very, very Yeah, low. very rare. So, uh, even then, like, in New York City, where it takes a half mile to get from one lane to the next, like, yeah, you're... <laughs> that's you, could not just, <laughs> you could just... <laughs> basically sleep it off in traffic you really could uh, you'll get to you'll get to the dui <laughs> checkpoint sober um we should call johnny langholz and see how he's, he feels about this yeah it's mr true. langholz <laughs> anyway let's um i want to talk about some more police related okay. sort of things uh mention you mentioned uh, jerry seinfeld before you had to do polar run and all these people are left oh yeah with his yeah well, We're we talked all, about his all, auction. all left wondering about jerry seinfeld yeah so uh there have not been any updates however i will go over the specifics okay uh, perfect people yeah. um so it all stems around uh, 1958 porsche 356a 1500 gsgt carrera speedster that's a really long name but that yes it is that exact model designation is extremely important 
for hmm. why this is a big deal. So, um, that 3 to 6A, they only made about 30 of those cars. Sure. Um, that were 1,500 GS Carrera Speedsters with the GT package. Um, Jerry Seinfeld, uh, back in 2016, sold off a large chunk of his collection. I imagine he was just, like, making space or something. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, he sold this for $1.54 million uh, at Amelia, Amelia Island to a car collection called Fika Frio. Um, I've, I did some research on Fika Frio. I could not find mu- anything really about them. <laughs> so uh, I do know that they're in the, the uh, uh, Channel Islands on the coast of France and England. Is That's where they're really? based out of. Yeah. I know so, Frio means cold in Italian. Well, um, there you go. So I'm guessing the man is probably cold. Should get him some Must blankets. Frio. That's probably, probably why, he's, why he's salty. Thought he came with a heater and it just didn't. <laughs> and I just <clears throat> can never use this That's Porsche. That's cold garbage. <laughs> um, so anyway, Fika Frio says that the car is not an actual GS GT. That's just a GS with all the GT stuff put on afterwards, which makes a big difference because they're – there are, although there are 30 actual GS GTs, there are a pretty sizable chunk of the GSs have been switched, have been converted to GTs. And that spec. is the two cam to the four cam? It, no, it's a four cam. They're both four cam because all the Carreras are four cams at that point. Um, that one, if I'm not mistaken, has larger brakes. It's like a track package. Sort okay, of thing, so this I is like correctly. the people just adding the factory parts on to the After car the that, fact. Okay, okay. Yep. As opposed to. It actually coming as a GT, which that's what makes it important. Anyway, you can just add the parts on. It's the fact that it came from the factory like that. Um, Jerry Seinfeld, in his defense, said, yeah, he will totally refund the cost. All he has to say, hey, can you show me some proof so I know what's going on with it? And then Fika Frio never responded. That's tacky. They never did anything. And then he just gets hit with a lawsuit from them. I've had things like that, not to that severity, obviously, but like I've sold things and like people are like, is this like this? I'm like, uh, I don't know. Send me a picture and I'll let you know. And then, yeah, they'll come back just like fuming mad. Not again, not with a lawsuit in my case, but just like, dude, I, just bring it back and I'll give you back your money because I don't know what's going on here, but yeah. I have no idea what you have in your hands right now. And if it's wrong, then I'll take it back. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, like at the end of the day, even if it is just a GS, like it's still an awesome car. But the difference right. is, instead of a one point five four million dollar car, it would then be like a six hundred thousand dollar car. Oh, oh shame. Well, I mean, you're losing. A, it's a million dollar swing in value. I get that. That's a huge deal. But I, I mean, all right. So, screwed. but this all comes down to Fika Frio, because you know Jerry Seinfeld. Just he's. I don't think he would do something like that. I don't think so either. He's too high profile yeah like he's got nothing to get and that's actually one of the things his lawyer said was like what does jerry have to gain like right like he has way more to lose than to gain from this it's like jay leno selling like a persang bugatti saying this is a real type 35 it's like no no it's a persang (laughs) it's it's a good car but like dude what the hell i'm guessing seinfeld probably owns some converted or modified cars as well yeah, and, that, and they well, were probably advertised as such when he bought them and or when he sold them. So, so. yeah, what, what Jerry Seinfeld said was that he's like he said if it was fake, I would totally take it back and give him give him the money back. Right. And all this uses a track car. It'd be a great track car. Like <laughs> this actually, be, kind of nice because yeah, then you can beat on yeah, it. Yeah, he's he's like I I literally have no problem with this if it is, and I will absolutely take it back. They can't have their money. In fact, I could I'll take care of him. You know for having to deal with all the shipping and everything. Like I'll help him out like sure jerry seinfeld's being a total gentleman about this it looks like all the weights on fika frio and their radio silence because several <laughs> news outlets have tried to contact them to no avail are you saying they've gone cold <laughs> oh! <laughs> nice one jana that was a funny one jana like that, that was pretty great <laughs> um, our level of tacky knows no yes. bounds I'm really proud of myself. <laughs> but we, we're gonna we're gonna keep on this. Uh, we all, uh, you know, at least I don't know, it's it's really hard for me to you know be entirely ob- objective about this because we like Seinfeld. Well, it's the thing. It's like it's yeah, it's so literally it's literally him. Jerry Seinfeld. Like this guy's like <sighs> disabled my ad blocker. Sure, yeah. Whatever. Um, <laughs> oh my god. Never mind. Screw this site you've got here. Oh. <laughs> I thought I had the. <laughs> I, I thought I had a different one. I'm sorry. No, you're good. But um, 
Yeah, no, it's just like it's Jerry Seinfeld. Like, the guy's like the most lovable dude, and he's I like, know. and he's a huge Porsche guy. He's a huge Porsche guy. Like he's like the Porsche guy, yeah. arguably. And furthermore, if you've ever seen Jerry Seinfeld like perform or anything or ever be interviewed, yeah, he doesn't have time for the bullshit this would take. No, like he's he is completely uninterested in doing that. He's got way easier things to do. <laughs> Like, why would he need to get an extra million dollars? Like, he could sell, like, one was, like, he's probably got a 924 that's worth that much money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is a 1979 Porsche 924 Turbo S2. Carrera. Yeah. Carrera. They made 37 of these cars. <laughs> this car is important because Enzo Ferrari once passed gas in it. <laughs> <laughs> It famously ran the bus off the road carrying Charles Manson to prison. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> I don't know. Like it, Something just, like that. It'd be some ridiculous, like, super Hollywood. I'm, I'm sure he's got a car like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure Jerry Seinfeld is a $1.54 million, <laughs> 924 This is the somewhere. Beatle Jeffrey Dahmer used. Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, With Porsche badges stuck on it. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm rooting well, for Jerry keep, in this. Keep keeping us apprised on this one. I'll be curious to hear what actually comes of it to see if Fika Frio is just full of it. Or like I, maybe I, the person that vetted it and said that the conversion happened or something like that wasn't legitimate. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure. But it seems like if they filed a lawsuit against Jerry Seinfeld, they probably have some reason to believe that it was converted. I think, you know what I think, realistically? I think that whoever they had inspect the car doesn't know what he's talking about. He's probably just like an old, like a classic car enthusiast kind of guy, just generally. Hmm. Like, his previous car he's inspecting is like a Ferrari 250 and doesn't know, like, what makes them different. I mean, right. that's entirely possible. Right. And, I mean, especially when you're dealing with really subtle nuances, like... That the yeah. GSGT Spider Carrera, whatever yeah. the crap it was. That's one of those really subtle nuances that makes a big, huge deal. Well, yeah, for the the actual people that are buying and selling these cars, it makes all the difference. Yeah, so I, I get that. Anyway, Burger, tell me about Polar Run. Okay, so I mentioned briefly at the beginning of this episode that the reason why there weren't two last week was because I was gone on the Polar Run, and I don't know if we covered this on Motor Cult before, because I think we started the podcast after Polar Run happened last year. Didn't we? I think when um, uh, Tyler was on. That was Cannonball. Oh, it was Cannonball. We probably briefly touched on the existence of Polar Run. I think you did, yeah. <clears throat> either way, so Corey and I, the sound engineer, went on Polar Run. I think this is the fifth year of the event occurring, and it's the fifth year we've gone. Um, we took the FJ. If you're wondering what we did... We went to the zoo and watched a red panda taking a nap. It was so cute. <laughs> but continue. <laughs> anyway, continue. Its little feet <laughs> were dangling off the tree, and it was twitching. A lot like Modi. It was cute. Oh, you guys are fascinating. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad you had a good time at the zoo. Um, for the most part, we had a good time in the Polar Run. Uh, it's a checkpoint-based road rally that raises funds for charity. Um we change up the destination every year. I wish we didn't, because the first two years we went to the North Shore of which Minnesota, great. Yeah. which is fabulous, beautiful, close, and you know pretty much within AAA tow distance yeah. of the cities. So that's all really good stuff. Um, year number three, we went to a Jewish kids summer camp that was super duper duper creepy <laughs> in uh, a really garbage yeah, five series. You, you don't want to go to camp in the middle of the Jewish. winter oh it's bad it, it's really bad so the pearlstein did, in did the wisconsin dells go look that up did, viewers did, did you pick up on what i was putting down there you don't want to go to camp if you're jewish yeah no i, I get it was like a whole holocaust thing was, <coughs> i'm jewish by the way so if anyway you're new to this so it's, it's not <laughs> insensitive <Jesus. laughs> so it was so bad um that we actually went on hotel tonight and booked a nearby hotel Ooh. And stayed there the entire weekend, Ooh. which had like a hot tub and continental breakfast. It was great. Nice. How was it this time, though? Uh, this time, actually, pretty good. Uh, I want to talk briefly on year number four. Which oh, we did oh, there's the no, this is this, is, this yeah. is the fifth year of it. It is. Yep. So year four, we went to Minocqua, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. which is just crappy upper northern eastern Wisconsin. The reason why we went there is because the rally organizer got engaged there very recently before then. And I think they were just up in that area anyway, like, we should just do the rally up here. Or something like that. So it was fine, but the internet was ass. The roads were terrible. Just nothing to look at. 
this year it was about an hour further east in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan that we ended up in Munising, I think it was. It was fine. We had really good hotel internet until we killed it by watching too much Twitch and playing games on it. Um, That's pretty funny, actually. But on the way back, the uh, FJ, uh, the alternator died. Oh. So we got 40 oh. minutes into our, what was it, six and a half hour drive home or something like that. Yeah, and in the middle like of the night at like, I guess it was 6.30 in the morning. Yeah. In the middle of rural Upper Peninsula of Michigan. The battery light comes on, on the dash of the FJ. Yeah, we need the headlights, and we have almost no cell service. So we find that there is an auto parts store. Actually, there's a few in a town about 40 minutes away on the way. So hmm. we made it on nothing but battery. Uh, Thank goodness I put any battery in the truck beforehand. No, really, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and we actually ended up going to, an, uh, I think it was an advanced auto parts, which was listed as opening at 7 a.m., which we're like, okay, that's 30 minutes. We'll wait, see if they have an alternator. While we're sitting there in the parking lot with the engine running with the lights off for heat, because it was like 9 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that, Corey notices <laughs> on the window in front of us it says closed Sundays, and it was a Sunday morning. So Google lied to us there. We get back on the Google, <laughs> find another auto parts store, there are, I think there's two Napa's that open at 10, and then there's an O'Reilly's that opens at 8, which is an hour and just over an hour and a half from where we were right then. You were trying to drive that on <clears> that battery? After we had just idled for like 15 minutes in the parking lot, too. So no. we, we make it there on the you battery. You made it to the O'Reilly's. Yeah, we made it to the O'Reilly on that other battery. Wow, that's a the, lot. That, that battery is... <laughs> it was a, a brand new AGM. I mean, it was a big boy, so... That's an I awesome get a, battery. What brand was that, by the Panasonic. way? Panasonic. It's a Panasonic. <laughs> so, there you go, guys. If you want a really skookum car battery, get a <laughs> that, Panasonic yeah, AGM. Yeah, Jesus. Because <laughs> it, it lasted like an hour with the lights on, with the engine running. With that's no amazing. alternator. That's absolutely phenomenal. So, we get to this O'Reilly parking lot, um, key the thing off, lock it walk next door to the McDonald's, get coffee to stay warm because yeah. running the car to you know get heat or whatever is obviously taking quite a bit of power on our already pretty unknown battery. Hour later, we walk inside, get up to the counter, and these guys are like, what can we do for you? <clears throat> I need an alternator for a 2007 Toyota FJ Cruiser, a 2008 Toyota 4Runner, or a 2008 Toyota Tacoma. Okay. They look up all three, none. Like, we don't get a lot of Toyotas around here. These are a special order. We just look at each other because the whole Upper Peninsula, like 30% of the vehicles we saw were Tacomas or FJs. There's, I think there was a Tundra in the parking lot. Yeah. The only vehicles we could see at the time were Toyotas. <laughs> the guy just told us, like, bold face, like, oh, we don't get a lot of Toyotas here. I'm just like, well. What? <laughs> so my next question was, okay. So, so you... I, I figured out what happened to this battery, actually. Okay. You went through a hole in the space-time continuum, and the year was actually 1978. <laughs> that's what happened. And Elaborate. That's what, that, I don't well, understand. You had to arrive to a point back in time before Toyotas were relatively oh, commonplace geez. in the Upper Peninsula, obviously. So what you were, what, where you were was 1978. But when you were Outside looking out the, the window... It was still 2019, and that's what happened, is you had actually gone back in time. I don't think that's entirely true, but I have no proof that it didn't happen. Yeah, because it's only only logical explanation when they say we don't get that many Toyotas here. Because that that's just a bold face. How do you not get that many? It's literally the best-selling brand. I think we drove past a house with, like, two or three FJ cruisers. Yeah, they had two FJs sitting in their driveway. So, all right, let's just kind of look at these statistics here. When they say that they don't, they don't see that many Toyotas. <clears throat> the Toyota Corolla is, is, like, the most, the largest total number of cars ever sold. Yeah, I believe that. As a Toyota Corolla, between all of its generations. Um... Uh, the Toyota Tacoma is the best-selling small pickup ever, and I think it's only behind, like, the F-150, because the F-150 has been around for, like, four times as long. Right. So, that's just not true. And again, <laughs> this is a rural area where reliability matters, and everyone's got a truck. And everybody's got, yeah. You everyone's a got a taco. Yeah, because it's the most reliable vehicle of all time. <clears throat> Pretty much. Maybe Which, actually one second we just we just answered our own question. That's why we don't. That's why they don't see, they don't have parts. They don't need it. They've never sold an alternator They've for a one GR. Never needed it. Yeah, it's and just again, like it doesn't break. It's pretty much true because like the FJ had two hundred and six K on it when this happened. Original alternator. So like I get it. That's way past an expected yeah. lifetime for an alternator. 
But the alternator in my old Forerunner lasted longer than that. Well, maybe the previous owner just like abused it. And, maybe like, it's just it had a dead battery in it its entire life. That could be, and the fact that I had like just done a new battery, but it failed awfully suddenly. But anyway, we're talking to this dude, no battery. So we're just sitting there sipping on their coffee, googling the lady that was working there. No alternator. There. You mean? What I say? Battery. Oh yeah, sorry. No mm -hmm. alternator. Um, the lady working on the other side of the store was like listening to all this. And apparently I'd started searching other stores. Like, Green Bay's got one. So we get on the phone. Google it. It's like 125 miles away. Uh, <sighs> and it's not really on the way, but it's kind of not out of the way. So You can make it happen. Bought a wrench and two car batteries for the FJ, which they had in stock. Were they also AGM? They were not. Conventional oh. lead acid. So I bought two of them. Okay. So I figure if we got 40 miles on an AGM with the lights on... It's now daylight, so we yeah. don't need lights. We can run without the blower motor. It'll be fine. Yeah. So bolt in one of the batteries, throw the other one in the trunk, which still had 11.5 volts. It still started the FJ, mm. but, you know, it probably totally smoked. It's actually sitting down there right now. I haven't even put it back in. The... still running on the one we got in <laughs> the UP of Michigan. <laughs> All right. But anyway, uh, we ended up making the 125 miles That's with awesome. one battery. Oh, That's nice. really cool. So we got down there. What did you do with the spare? I returned it. Oh. I was just about to ask, <laughs> did you return it? Luckily, they let us. I asked is the guy, it, like... What, what, what group size is it? 35 or 27? Uh, whatever huge enormous is. Oh, I don't so know. it's, 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 like not, the it's biggest... not like your normal one. Okay. No. Not so. no. Oh, that's why it worked. It, it has like a train 120 <laughs> minute reserve capacity. Good Lord. Yeah. <clears throat> so there's that. I think that's why it, it worked fine. And the guy, we were telling him about the story picking up the alternator in Green Bay. He's like, hey, the alternator must have been working a little bit. You know, I wouldn't have made it that distance. I'm like, I didn't have the heart to tell him. Like, we had it tested at the first O'Reilly, and it's like dead, dead. Yeah. Like, engine running 11.5 volts. Like, ain't no alternator there, bud. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so this off-the-shelf battery, cheapo, that, you know, who knows how long I've been sitting there, had enough charge to get us. There's a train coming by. 120 miles. Choo -choo. Yeah, that's a loud choo-choo. But anyway, yeah. Would we, you say that's <clears throat> choochin? It is choochin. It's a skookum choo <laughs> And when we got down there, um, I actually asked for the Forerunner alternator first because it's the same size, the same price, and it's 130 amps instead of 100. I guess like, we don't have that. I'm like, shoot, fine. Uh, do you have one for a Tacoma? 100 amps, same as the FJ. Nope. I'm like, oh, no. The computer said you had an alternator. I'm like, what about an 07 FJ? It's like, yeah, yeah, I got one of those. I'm like, okay, it's the same. Give me that, please. So we had oh one God. of those in stock somehow. Bought a metric tool kit for like $83. Took them out to the parking lot. Immediately lost a 10 millimeter deep socket there out you of go. this kit. Perfect. That's <laughs> like... <laughs> the story of everyone's life. Yep, it was just so ironic. Down into it, just like, it, it, you popped it out. No, like, and that flew was over your shoulder and like, went down a well. <laughs> it wasn't even that, because I did that. And, like, I dropped like seven sockets, and they all went through the engine bay. But I had the 10 mil deep on my quarter inch ratchet. I set it on the battery when I was taking off a heat shield. I pick up the socket wrench. The socket is gone. <laughs> No noise, no nothing. A bird took Somehow it. Somehow it unlocked it from my ratchet and flew away. <laughs> so I have a complete metric toolkit down there without a 10 mil deep. Who knows? I don't, it's probably still in the FJ somewhere. It's now but... worth precisely zero dollars. <laughs> so I get it changed out in a half hour in the parking lot, pouring snow. Corey's freezing to death because he just rooted around in the snow looking for sockets for like 20 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> uh, go inside, return the core. Things charging just fine. Fuel up and head home pretty uneventfully. But I think we passed 137 cars. And the side I of think it was more than that. So, just because the left lane wasn't plowed and everyone speaking, was in conga lines in the right lane. Speaking of um, 4x4s with yes. V6s and manual transmissions. Yes. I've been thinking I want a 4x4. Okay. I think I found the 4x4 that I want. It's very hard to find, though. Am I even prepared for this? No, you're not. Is it? No, it's not. Oh. I want to try and find a rust-free first-gen MPV. I, that might be possible. I think that'd be, like, that'd be perfect, because I, I have a Mazda 5 for my daily. This would be the original version of the Mazda 5. <laughs> uh, and it'd be cool as hell. Like, what's cooler than a 4x4 manual V6 rear-wheel drive biased minivan? Like nothing. That's Literally, pretty cool. That's yeah. like the coolest thing. 
<laughs> like, you can't beat that. I did not know they offered them with the V6 manual and four-wheel drive all at once. Yes, you can get that. Oh, jeez. Yeah. pretty I'd cool. Pretty pretty cool. Because it's, it's just <laughs> the same drivetrain as, like, the whatever the V6 version of the... The, I think the B2600 was the V6 pickup. It's it's a longitudinal... Yeah, it's rear-wheel drive. Like, they're really so cool. So it has, like, a transfer case and stuff in it? Yeah. It's, like, it's literally, like, a big, hairy, off-road four-wheel drive Weird. system. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty... Yeah, you should get one of those. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, a super cool truck. It's going to be hard to find an all-wheel drive one that's clean, though. Well, my friend Tyler showed me one that was an automatic V6 all-wheel drive. Hmm. That'd be pretty cool. But no. it was it was just super crusty. No, but it was also three hundred dollars. Yeah, that's the thing. It needs to be manual. That's my thing. <laughs> and if it's but quirky, I do like the quirky. But the thing is, it has to be a four wheel drive because the two wheel drive, I I will be tempted to lower it and put it on BBSs and tint the windows <laughs> and make it into Bismarckies and BB they used to have. But anyway, uh, speaking of Mazda, uh, and I want to talk Good about. God. Uh, some news actually from Japanese Nostalgic Car. If you can throw up uh, the link, uh, this I is can throw up. the greatest website on the internet. If you are interested, in there are no biases at Jap- all. It, if you are interested at all in collecting Japanese cars, this is the place to go. Anyway, so uh, after 35 years, this long lost RX7 Le Mans race car was found like in a barn or something. Um, it been like lost of history like for the longest time. Um, they have a picture of it. It's originally a black and gold uh, Jun uh, liveried car. Jun is a very famous uh, tuning company in Japan. Hmm. Um, but uh, no, it, it's actually really cool because this car didn't win anything at all. Like it just actually didn't. It did totally okay. However, <laughs> this is a completely average car. However, this car was a massive, massive improvement. To what eventually became the 787B. Ooh, ooh, I like that. Yeah, because this was this was the last Mazda Le Mans car with a rotary in it, where they tried to do it on a production car chassis, and it was actually the production car chassis that let the car down, not not anything else. <laughs> um, so that's what the issue was. So once they dis- once they got this car and they went, oh my god, that that's like this is the car that gave Mazda the kick in the ass to make the 787B. Okay. Uh, and I think that's just kind of the coolest thing in the world. Uh, if you can scroll down a little bit, um, Mazda's always had a, a history of it. But, I mean, it's a, actually, like, as a car, it's, like, a really dope, like, wide-body, kind of looks like a Bosuzoku car. I'd, like, it's super cool. With like the, the, the Dorito in the front and Mazda Speed? That looks like a way older picture than Mazda Speed. No, Mazda Speed's been around. That's been Mazda's, like, tuning thing since, like, the late 70s. Huh. Yeah. Didn't so. Yeah, they've been around forever. Um, TIL. First time I ever saw that was on the Mazda Speed Protégé right after the MP3. Oh, yeah. No, the, the, the 77B was a Mazda Speed. Really? Yeah. Hmm. It says Mazda Speed all over it. But uh, Oh, wow. Yeah, you can see the direct. Look at that. You can see the direct uh, history. But it's yeah, that FDE. It's really, really cool. Uh, and that's actually the Mazda Speed body kit for the FDE. That, I love those that wheels. That mirrored those, uh, a lot of this car. Um, those wheels are beautiful. But in Japan, though, this car is even more important. J- J.A. Pan. Yeah, in J- J.A. Pan. Um, speaking of Bosuzoku cars, uh, honey, look, they painted it pink. Pink. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in, in, J- in Japan, um, in Bosuzoku culture, they, that's where they have like the ridiculous yep. exhaust and the crazy body kits. Yeah. Uh, people say these body kits look ridiculous on street cars. Well, that's where it came from. Like... Every time they did those body kits, where it's like it's crazy, gigantic, like blister fenders, they were replicating a real race car. So, um, this car was actually hugely important for influencing uh, Shakatan Bosuzoku culture, which is pretty cool. Influencing, influenzaing, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, the yeah. There's one that was destroyed in a crash, and this particular one is the last known one. So it's Whoops. Pr- pretty big deal. Um, very, very cool to see that this car exists. I'm really happy that it exists as well because this is just, like, the coolest shit in the world. <laughs> like, I love it. I, I have a soft spot for 80s, like, homologation race cars. Oh, yeah. Like, I love these, like, 8-inch, like, Pia truck lights that they put behind <laughs> these, like, plexiglass 
dishes into the oh man it's just I, so cool. I like the louvers on the hood like the, yeah. the actual scalloped hood they had uh, they had one machine for scallop dyes and they just used it a bunch yeah oh dude, I on love, everything i love scalloped hoods I want, I, want, I want to do that to Blubsky because it needs it really bad. Yeah, I'm going to do that on, on the Subaru once I get everything sorted out. So I'm going to scalp the hood over the turbocharger. Got to love hot engines. Exactly. But it looks cool as hell. Anyway. I, I do really like old cars, but that's fascinating that they actually use like a production chassis car before and directly before yeah. <laughs> something like the 787B. Oh, oh, and that's the thing is like that's <laughs> like you can obviously tell they just added like a ton of of aluminum onto a factory car. Yeah, just like, to accommodate like five times wider wheels. Oh yeah, these wheels were like insane. Like if you look at those wheels, they are like fifteen by fifteen square wheels. Look at this thing. It still has the five lug hubs on it. It's yeah, not even it a does. center lock car. Yeah, it's literally just a production <laughs> car. It's super cool. <laughs> Also, that's another thing that needs to make a comeback is square wheel sizes. <laughs> yeah. Or over square. <laughs> or wider than it is uh, tall. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, wider than it is in diameter. It's width, yeah, it's width is, width is larger than its diameter. That's one of my favorite things about like... Cr- old like, one wheels and stuff. Yeah, something. like old crawls and stuff. Is I used to know a guy up here. He had uh, 13 by 15 inch wheels on his crawl. They were so Can ridiculous. Can you imagine finding tires for something like that? He had to run is. Hoosier Racing Slicks. <laughs> That's the only tire that fit that wheel anymore. <laughs> Those aren't even road legal for the no, most part. No, they're not. <laughs> but um, no, now in Japan, there's actually a Yokohama, uh, their Advan line, they're bringing back some of those tires. And then I think Sumitomo, <laughs> amazingly. Uh, and Avon. And Avon, yeah. Those three brands, I think, have a tire that fits a over square, like 13 inch wheel, which is like my favorite thing in the world. But um, no, they would they would do this um, where they do it over square because the production mm-hmm. cars were meant to have a smaller wheel on it. But when they go out racing, of course, you can't go any larger, so you just gr- grow out. Right. And then the interesting thing with the brakes, though, what they would do with that because you're now you're, you're now limited to having a 13 inch wheel. Yeah. You have these like super like thick like brakes. Mm-hmm. Like instead of getting taller, they get wider right. to dissipate heat and or dissipate heat uh, I, like I, I did that again I dissipating don't know what, precipitation yeah Dissipate? i don't know I don't, I don't know what's wrong with me it's probably um, a spurgy but no it's um a nascar they run like twin calipers too yeah nascar still does that yep so i think it's just the coolest thing um i'm really happy that's there and uh it's a huge piece of japanese ammo of history that we found so well i'm glad you brought up some positive automotive history because <sighs> We're now, unfortunately, making more negative automotive future history. And that's as best I can set this up. Uh, 40 countries breaking. have now gotten together in what I'm calling the UN of automotive regulation. And I they're mandating about, yeah. automatic braking in new cars. So Why? Because people can't be trusted with driving. So, hey, hang on one second here. Um, how does that work <laughs> as manual transmission? Uh, it will stall the car. Perfect. Well, hopefully many, many people will die and these politicians will be voted out. Yep. Moving on. Yep. That's uh, it. Now, I want to end our show on a positive note. Good. Let me take uh, this off this the screen so we don't have to look at it. Yes, Jana. <laughs> what right. is something positive that I've you been waiting have to tell us? I've been waiting two freaking weeks to tell you guys this. She found this out immediately after. Yes, the last I found time. this out like last Saturday. Oops. And I'm so excited to share with you. Well, let me turn that. Off the game, though. Are you ready? Yeah. Platypi, lack or er, instead of lactating like you Through know normal boobs. mammals yeah. like with boobs, they sweat milk. There you go. I think Corey does that. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people in the Midwest. I'm pretty that sure. That. I'm pretty sure the, the platypi or plat. Platypi is plural for platypus. No, wow. Thank you, Ryan. I did not know. Well, we also, we have a lot of people that aren't, you know, into entomology. So. That's true. Which, I've Which been they will be the now. Entire... Yeah, they will be. You're welcome, um, all Carbitrage listeners, for learning really so, interesting so facts. So, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. Right? So, they, like, when they're, like, hustling around and they start getting sweaty, milk comes out? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think... <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't this research Corey. this heavily, but um, from what I can assume, I, I assume it's both males and female that do this, because I don't think only one sex of platypi could sweat milk. That Are seems they hermaphroditic? Very... No, um, I think they have pouches that hide them, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a platypi expert, but <laughs> I, I love 
animal facts because well i like psyduck so yeah. i'm pretty sure that makes oh me yeah Same exactly thing. Psy- that, so that and means does psyduck you know Psy- i another fact about the platypi is that i think it's just the males have these spikes on the back of their feet hmm. that are um venomous Yes, they are. Yeah. Not, mm. not poison. I th- they're either poisonous or venomous. I don't so don't they pick up a male we, we saw that on the Irwins, and it, it, yes. it is venomous, yeah. Um, so Scary. the platypi, if you ever want to, like, like just the find weirdest creature. <laughs> the rules of, like, evolution were just thrown out the window. They were defenestrated. Um, they took the you windows the off of them? No, no, they threw them no, out the, the window. That's the defenestration. That's the verb is. Oh. Of I know fenestration is windows. Yeah, defenestration. De- means de- means yeah, but in architecture, that means to take out windows. Oh, well, in, in, in everywhere else, human English, yeah, it means it's to, to remove throw from out windows. the window. Hmm. Yeah, cool. To defenestrate. There's another fun fact. Actually, I, I think I think the the exact definition of defenestrate is to remove through what window. What about defecate? Uh, that, no, that's... that's yeah, it's Modi. Oh. But no, if you uh, defenestrate Ophel, you're throwing like no, I, I think body parts out the window. D- defenestration, I think, yes. is, Which is to r- remove via window. <laughs> okay. So, it, yeah, you can defenestrate a person. Cool. Teddy Roosevelt threatened to do that. Um, now, for my fun fact that I learned that made me happy this week, um, when, the, when Toyota first came to America, they had some weird naming conventions, like in the 1950s. So they almost named their cars Toilet. <laughs> because that would have been like the MR2 being mailed in French, which yes. means shit, and the Nova, which means don't doesn't go yes. in Mexico. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So um it Toy- yeah, Toyota had almost named themselves Toilet because they were trying to come up with a name that's like Toyota but small. So luckily in the eleventh hour they came up with Toyo Pet. But uh, I found out that the Toyota Corona its first name when it first came to America was the Toyota Pet Tiara. And the reason they called it that, it was rare because it was a Toyota made prior to the 90s that didn't have its name start with a C. Because a Tiara is a small crown, and their other car was the full size Toyota crown. And it was the same thing, but tiny. So I told that to Jan, and she went, aw. aw. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my fun fact that I learned that made me happy this week. What about you, Burger? Uh, I learned that Porsche 901 and Porsche G50 transaxles were offered in both magnesium and aluminum variants. Really? That's actually really cool. Yeah. I imagine those magnesium or ones. Or not G50s, uh, uh, 901s and 915. So the, the first two five-speed that for the Porsche, for, for the, the 911s, 911s yeah. yeah. So the G50s were the they're like the desirable and they're the yeah. really strong ones with the better synchros, but they're also not desirable because they're way too heavy. Yeah, those are the ones where they're always specified on brand trailer to have a G50 tranny. Right, which apparently is better if you have a 3.2 or greater displacement 911, but if you have a smaller displacement early car, you want a 915 transaxle because you, you can go. build those because they're like 70 pounds lighter. Oh my god, that's huge. Yeah, G50s are huge. And also I learned you can get a 4, 5, or 6-speed G50. That's actually really cool. There you go. That, are the magnesium ones like super and like unaffordable? Yeah, yes. yeah, I'd imagine. I was uh, I was at an old Porsche shop in the middle of nowhere helping them with their E30 last night. Didn't know anything about this place until I showed up. Awesome people, Johnson cool. Motorsport. Um, and where, they, where are they located? They're down in Jordan, Minnesota. Okay, but they have probably six dozen Porsche transaxles, Excellent. all really rare ones, and they had just an empty magnesium case. You could lift the thing up like with an angle with one hand. That's amazing. It's like a five-pound case. That's super cool. It's just nuts. So anyway, yeah, Porsche Transaxles. You do not want a 901, but you can make them okay. The 915, I hope I'm saying that right. There is a middle-generation trans, yeah. trans that's the one you want. Unless um, you got a big power Do- engine, sure, then get a G50. I'm sure Doc Brown will correct us when he hears this. So. Yeah, I texted, I texted Tom. I'm like, do you know about these people? He's like, Oh yeah, they've they were they've worked on all my cars. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, cool, cool, small world. Uh, but yeah, we, there you go, magnesium you case you get, transmissions. You, sh- there. you should see if you can get one of them uh, on the podcast. Really I cool. lightly asked, and they didn't respond to it at all. So when he shoots me an email for parts request, I'll ask him again. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Because they're um, they're awesome. Yeah, it sounds super cool. Corey, what about you? What did you learn about hentai this week? Yeah. Or what did you learn about random access memory this week? Mm. All right, there we go. All right. Corey learned uh, this week that in Japan, uh, the term for a transgendered female or a ladyboy is a new half. Anyway, oh, there what? we go. What?
<laughs> That's what Corey learned this week. Wait, why do you know that? Why do you know that? You're the one that told me that. Anyway, thank you for listening to Motor Cult. We, or not Motor Cult. <laughs> <laughs> for listening to Carbitrage, that was our old name. Um, we almost made an entire episode without messing anything yeah, up. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, I ruined it. I ruined the whole episode. I just have to think so hard during the intro. Don't worry. Uh, just throw you this. forgot to give me a Valentine's Day presents. No, no, I have him. We just sat yeah. down and watched Bones all night. Yeah, which so. is awesome. But he very forgot. romantic. It yes. is very romantic. Now it's a three-day like saga <sighs> of Valentine's Day. Because actual Valentine's Day, we were at your house. And then we uh, spent... Laser this night was Valentine's Day? Yeah, it's the 14th. Oh, and that's cool. Yesterday, we celebrated our Valentine's Day by going to Galactic Pizza and having... Uh, I sure hope some Bone okay. watching. Yes. Uh, and then uh, having bone watching. Watching Bones. Um, Bone watching? <laughs> yeah. Bone watching. And now today we're going to have our so gift exchange. Like That's what I tried to say was today we're going to have our gift exchange and we're going to finally have our... so close to our yeah. Then we're going to have our three-day Valentine's Day saga. I literally have no idea what's happening most of the time we're recording these episodes. For the no, we're just kind of I'm like an old on man. It's like a senile old man wandering around a city. <laughs> just <laughs> babbling on about nonsense. Anyway, anyway we'll catch you guys midweek. Thank Thanks you. for listening. Bye.